I recently got the opportunity to go on a pretty cool trip. And uh, we went to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, from this church was me and Kara Raglan. But all together is a Virginia district. We had 106 people, uh, which is pretty cool. I was pretty blown away. It was about 86 students, and the rest were adults. Uh, so we went out. We, we flew out of Richmond and Dulles. So many we couldn't fit on one plane. So we flew out of Richmond and Dulles and flew out to Arizona and uh, had an awesome week. God was really there, and he moved, and I had a lot of conversations with students that felt God changing their heart and changing things in their lives, and God calling some students to ministry, and them trying to figure that out and figure out that process, and it was awesome. It was cool to see God move and work with 8,000 people from all over the U.S. and all over Canada, meeting together in one place. It was just, it was beautiful. Just to see everyone together, the camaraderie of everyone there, um, there was always someone to talk to on the elevator, in the line for the elevator, <laughs> there was always someone to talk to. Um, and what they talked about that week is something I want to share with you guys this morning. Um, the theme for the week is NYC is not New York City, for the record. It's Nazarene Youth Conference. Um, and so the theme this, this, this year was love God, love others, and then to live love. Uh, so that's kind of where I want to I want to start this morning. So the, the focus verse that they had for the whole week, everything was based off of this and out of this, and everything moved around this one verse. So if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, it's going to be Matthew 22, 26 through 30. And I'm going to be reading it out of the message, so it might sound a little bit different than what you have in front of you. Uh, but we do have it on the screen. So when the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religion scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show him up. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs and everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. When looking at any verse in scripture, whenever you're reading through the Bible, it's important to look through a, a specific lens, right? Because the Bible wasn't wrote yesterday. It's wrote in a completely different language, in a completely different time, in a completely different culture, Right? So we might read it and go, oh, I get what that means. No big deal. I don't need to, you know, I get it, got it, good, right? So some verses, you can do that, right? Genesis 1-1, you don't need to do like a, a big research on it, right? You, you get it. Or Psalm 23 or John 3-16, all these verses that we know and love and we understand, you know, to our core, right? We've been doing those since VBS where we can walk. But there's some verses in the Bible that you read and you go, I think my Bible's got a typo. Is that supposed to be in there? Anybody ever read a verse like that? You read and you're like, um, I think they uh, swap pages, right? So an example of one of those, I was doing Sunday school with the teens the other day, and there's a little book that I think Karen uh, had gotten for us called Prime, and I was just flipping through and just picked one and went, you know, this looks good, we'll talk about this today. And I went to read the verse and I went, Wait a second. This is what I read. So this is Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me, this is Jesus talking, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Wait a second. <laughs> Jesus was all about love, right? Loving others, loving God. But if you just take that, you know, well, I guess I don't need my family now or friends. You know, I'll just do it on my own. But if you look deeper, and for me it was just a, a simple change in translation, right? So let's read it through a different translation. See how that kind of shifts our perspective. So one day, when large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. 
Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. So when you read it like that, ah, it, it makes sense, right? Like, I'm, okay, I'm not supposed to hate people. That's good. I don't like to hate people. I'm going to love people, right? But that just goes to show how important it is to look through Scripture the right way. Have you ever heard someone take, like, Scripture way out of context just to call you out on something? Anybody? Just me? Okay, cool. Awesome. And it, it's hurtful, right? Because, because you know that what you're doing is right, but someone has this, this skewed perspective, this skewed view. And they're, just, they're using Scripture, but it's not through the right lens, right? Sometimes that's even how Satan works. Sometimes Satan will use Scripture. That's a little scary, right? But Satan used it with Jesus. But it didn't trip him up because Jesus knew what it really meant. And that's what's important for us, to know what Scripture really means when we read it. Not just a surface level, but in depth, because it can change everything. So I had a, a really cool class in college, and one of my all-time favorite classes. I had this really genius professor. He had either five or seven doctorates. Um, I remember one time we were in class, and he started writing on the board, and went, oh, I'm sorry, that's the Hebrew, and then started writing in English from memory under it. And it's just like, all right, we know you're smart, but come on. But uh, his name was Dr. Varig. He's just a genius, super smart guy, easy to learn from. And the class I took was called Biblical Hermeneutics. All right, I want you guys to say that five times really quick. All right. Basically, what that means is biblical interpretation. So it's this whole class set aside that all you do in the class is you write a type of paper, which she loves writing papers. Definitely not me. All right. <laughs> but uh, we wrote these papers, and they're called an exegesis, which is a really fun word that basically just means a paper that's explaining what this one verse or maybe a group of verses means. Um, and there's uh, these five different aspects that you look at in an exegesis. Um, there's these five different lenses, Right. And I know you guys all saw me walk up here with these. But it's kind of like binoculars, right? Anybody ever used binoculars before? Cool. Hopefully in the woods, right? So binoculars have multiple lenses, and you have to use this little button on top right here, and that focuses them. But it takes all of these lenses for it to work. If you only have one lens, it just makes everything blurry, or it works for one specific scenario, but maybe not across the board. It only works in one spot. But with all of these together and working in harmony as a team, you can truly see something that seems far off and maybe distant, a little blurry and a little fuzzy. If you can bring it close and clear and you can see it in its fullness, right? So this morning, I just kind of want to walk through these five steps, these five lenses, um, so that when we look at Scripture, we can truly see what was meant, what God's really trying to tell us. So the first, the first lens we want to look at is who the writer is. So there's multiple writers throughout the whole Bible, right? There's Moses, there's all the apostles, there's Paul, there's some more Paul, and then a couple more Paul, right? <laughs> but there's different writers throughout. But each writer has their own style and their own perspective, their own life experiences, their own lens that they looked at life through. So for our verse today, Matthew 22, the, the greatest commandment it's called. The author is Matthew, right? The apostle. So what are, what are some things that we maybe know about Matthew? He was an apostle, right? Matthew had another name. He had, he had two names. Matthew also went by the name of Levi. But he was also a tax collector. Everybody loves tax collectors, right? Right? We don't even see a tax collector collectors anymore. We just have like this little like envelope we send to them. I don't blame them. If I was a tax collector, I wouldn't want to be seen either. You know what I mean? But in that time, he would have been looked at as a traitor because it wasn't ran by the Israeli government. It was ran by the Romans. So as a tax collector, you worked for the Romans. You worked for the usurpers, the conquerors, the ones that overthrow Israel, the ones that don't love God. You're a sellout. That's how his culture would have looked at him. Just by being a tax collector, he would have been ceremonially unclean. He would have not been allowed to go into the temple. 
he couldn't have even worshipped God with his brothers and sisters and his family. There would have been that distance, right? That isolation. However, he probably would have had a fairly cushy life because tax collectors kind of, as a rule back then, raised a little extra for themselves, right? But that's not going to get you a lot of friends. But the goal is to know Matthew, right? So when we're looking at this verse, we want to know who he is, the way he looked at life. What are some words or what are some things that would have stood out to him? Different things have different levels of importance to some people, but some things that would have really stood out to Matthew were maybe forgiveness or being part of a group of not having to be alone, being accepted. But some things that might have been hard for Matthew to, to really grasp or to like live in while he was walking with Jesus was this nomadic lifestyle, right? He was a tax collector. He probably had a pretty nice home that he could go back to every day, you know, kind of living this cushy life. He wasn't living no cushy life with Jesus, right? The Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was homeless. And by virtue of that, all of his apostles were homeless too, right? And it's not like it's like, you know, Southern California, 70s all day. It's like 115 during the day and then like 50, 60 at night. And they're homeless and they're wandering and they're going from city to city spreading the good news. So that kind of gives us a little bit of a better picture of who, of who Matthew was, right? Maybe. Kind of, sort of, yeah. So this, this next lens that we want to look through, I'll try to run through these quick, is going to be the audience. So who was Matthew writing to? We, kn- we know who Matthew was, right? But who is the, the people that he wrote this letter to? I know that it's long, but it was actually a letter that he wrote. But who was, who was Matthew writing to? And why is, why is that important? Why does it, I don't care who he wrote to, I'm, I'm reading it, it's in the Bible, it's written to me, Right? Well, anybody have any little kids or little nieces and nephews or some people it's, it's their dog and they call you out, right? You talk a little different to kids, don't you? You're not like, hey, how's it going? It's, hey there, you little cute little guy. How are you doing today? You know, you talk completely different. You, your voice is higher. You smile way more than you really do. And you like bend over to talk to them so you can get on their level, right? If Matthew had wrote this to like a bunch of infants, you know, it would have been different. It would have worded things different. When we do children's ministry, you say things differently. You're coming from a different perspective. When we do youth ministry, you word things different. It's the same message, but you're coming at it with a different angle. You're breaking it down into a way that people can understand for the audience that you're writing to, right? So that's important because it lets us know why maybe Matthew would have put some things in there and maybe left out some things. So for this one specifically, um, Matthew wrote the, <laughs> the book of Matthew was wrote to the Jews living in Israel there's a lot of ancestry in there when he's telling about the lineage of Jesus there's a lot of references about the law like the greatest commandment that would have been really really important to the Jews the, the best job you could have as a Jew was being a religious leader like a Pharisee or a Sadducee they would even they would follow after those people they would go to school and the people that they were following if they had a limp, they would start to limp like that person. They wanted to be so much like them. They were the, the celebrities, the movie stars of the time, right? But Jesus, I mean, uh, Matthew is writing to these people, these Israelites, these Jews. So the next lens we want to look through is going to be the style of writing. And I kind of gave a little bit of a spoiler of that. It's a letter, right? But there's different kinds. There's poems, like the Psalms. There's wisdom writing like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. There's narratives like Genesis. There's prophetic writings like Isaiah. There's historical writings like the Book of Kings. There's apocalyptic writings like Revelation. But this gospel would fall under a narrative. More specifically, it's going to be a firsthand account of Jesus' life and ministry. In this point, it's, it's very important because the type of writing is important. So this makes me think of a movie. All right, who in here has Netflix? Who actually pays for their own Netflix? Fess up, you sinners. All right, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so there's a movie on Netflix. It's called True Memoirs of an International Assassin. Has anybody ever seen it? Cool, just me. Awesome. 
All right, so I'm a really big fan of Kevin James, the actor, and this is one of his movies. So in the movie, he's a writer, and he's writing this book, and he has this, like, desk job. He doesn't really do anything. He goes to work for, like, an insurance company, and he comes home, and he has, like, this one friend that he talks to that has these crazy stories, and he kind of uses those crazy stories in this book that he's writing. So he finishes his book, finally. He sends it in to his publisher as a, a fiction novel, un, you know, under the name True Memoirs of an International Assassin. Well, his publisher sees this and goes, you know, I think we'd get a lot more money if we made this a nonfiction book. So she changes it on him. And he's, you know, trying to send the book to his mom because that's what you do, right? So he looks and he's like, oh, man, this is under nonfiction. And, like, that night he gets kidnapped and, like, taken to South America because they really think he's an assassin. So just this one little twist, right, turns his world upside down just from being fiction or nonfiction. But that's important for this because in Scripture, there's different kinds of Scripture, and there's some Scripture that we can kind of take figuratively, right? So maybe Psalms 23. Did God really make David lie down in green pastures? Like, literally, like, lay down right there, right? Maybe, maybe not, but that's not the point. The point is that God is our peace, right? But in a narrative, like the book of Matthew, when Jesus said something, Jesus said something. It wasn't just this, oh, this is kind of cool, you know? I'll get some of the words right. No, they were intentional. Every single word, every syllable, every single event that happened was important. So we can trust that everything in this is important. So this second to last lens we're going to look at is context. So context is probably one of the simpler ones. All these other ones that I've been talking about, you don't have to like get a commentary. They're in like, if you have a study Bible, they're going to be at the beginning of the chapter. They're going to have them spelled out for you. Easy, you don't like have to work hard. They're there, they're waiting on you, okay? The context, you got to work for a little bit, okay? So the context is where you take this one verse that you're reading. So for us, it's Matthew 22, uh, 26 through 30. Yeah, yep, 34 through 40, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so for this verse, you can take it as it is, and you kind of get a little bit of background just from the verse itself. Jesus is talking to some religious leaders. They quiz him. He schools them, right? End of story. Cool. But if you look a couple chapters back, you see the setting, which is the next point, and I'll kind of talk about these together. Um, but you see where Jesus is, and Jesus is in Jerusalem, in the temple. Do you know how Jesus got to Jerusalem? on the donkey when they laid down the palm branches and their jackets for Jesus to enter in. And they celebrated him. Hallelujah. Right? This is right after Palm Sunday. If we know it's right after Palm Sunday, we know something else is coming, right? But Jesus also knows that something else is coming. You look at the scripture by what's around it, and it gives it this depth, and it gives it this richness. We know that Jesus knows where he's going. He knows where he's coming. When you look in the whole chapter of Matthew, it's this, this focal point. It's right. It's the highlight of the story. It's the crescendo, right? The climax of a movie. And then you look at it through this whole narrative of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. And it's right at this time. We judge all of history by this next week that's coming up in the story. This next week, we, we date our time from this as after this or before this, right? All of history revolves around this one moment that's coming up, and Jesus knows it's coming. And Jesus is telling this crescendo moment to us. He's summing up everything that it means to be a Christ follower, to love God and to love others. Everything that it means to be a Christian. You ever have someone come and ask you, like, what it means to be a Nazarene? Christian missional holiness, right? It's good, it's true. But when they came up and asked Jesus, he said to love God with everything in you, your passion, your prayer, your intelligence. And he said to love others more than you love yourself. But through this context, we see this crescendo moment happening. 
And last but not least is the setting. I'm just going to throw this in there really quick because the setting is important. And it's not the setting when it's taking place, but it's the setting that it was wrote. So Matthew just didn't write this a week after it happened or a year after it happened. Matthew wrote this about 15 to 30 years after this had happened. Well, that's kind of funny, right? Well, why that's important is because when Jesus ascended to heaven and he said, I'm coming back, they thought he meant like, you know, I'll see you tomorrow about five o'clock, right? They weren't thinking that, you know, it might be a couple thousand years. That's a reasonable assumption, right? But after a couple years of waiting for a couple days, a couple weeks, and Pentecost happens, and the missionaries are spread throughout Europe, a couple months later, a couple years later, you know, it might be a while. I might meet Jesus up there before he meets me down here. So they start to think, like, we got to make sure people can always know about this, not just in the here and now, but in the future. And they start looking ahead. And that's when Matthew writes, writes his gospel. But it's not some whimsical journal entry of just like, oh, remember when, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000 and that was pretty cool. And no, it's intentional. They would have been prayed over. Every little detail. They would have talked to friends to, to triple check and quadruple check that everything they were writing was correct, that everything happened the way they remembered it. This wasn't just some, you know, little essay you're going to turn into your teacher and forget you ever wrote. This was meant to last. This was for all of humanity forever. And they knew the importance of this. So they didn't take this, ta this task lightly. Big conferences like NYC that I went to are these crescendo moments in people's lives. It's these life-changing events that before I was this way and after this, I'm different. I'm changed. There's something else in here. There's something here, right? Before there was death and now there's life. It's normally how, how things go. Normally you start with life, but no, Jesus speaks into this emptiness and creates life. Jesus was in one of these crescendo moments. Like he's trying to nail the point home. If you didn't get anything else I've gotten that I've told you this far, if you haven't got any of that, I want you to remember these two things before I finish my ministry. These are the two most important commandments that have been not just from me, but from all of history are these two points, right? And Jesus is driving these home as crescendo moments. So now that we know this, this richness and this depth to this scripture, does it give you a little bit of a different perspective? Do you see it a little differently? Do you see why this was so important? So let's break it down a little bit. The first command is to love God with all of your passion and your prayer and your intelligence. I like this wording. I looked at it a couple of different translations, and this one just stuck out to me. Your passion, your prayer, and your intelligence. How do you love God with your passion? What is your, your passion? What drives you in life? What makes you wake up? What makes you push you to do what you do? Sometimes it's seeing brokenness in the world, seeing hurt people, and your mission is to help them, right? It's seeing lonely people, and your mission is to comfort them, to give them a friend. It's seeing people that are lost and wanting them to be found. It's what we see, it's what we feel, it's what we see in justice and pain and sorrow. But it's that, that drive that pushes us to fix it. You don't have to live broken. You don't have to live in pain or in sorrow because we have this hope that we can share, right? You don't, creation doesn't have to be this way. That's loving God with our passion. And next is prayer. Loving God with prayer. It seems kind of like a redundant, like, well, duh, that's why we're talking to him, right? But let me take it a little bit deeper for you. It's not just praying you know, Jesus, I want a pony, and I'd really like to have a new, you know, nice car, maybe a bigger house, and if you could change this weather, which is valid, don't get me wrong, <laughs> you 
you could change this weather to be like a perfect 72 all the time. That would be great. You know, maybe let the leaves change a little longer, a little brighter. Like, it, it's not that. It's, it's Jesus in the garden when he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I know it's going to be hard. I know what's ahead of me, but I trust you. I trust you to, to take care of me through this journey, to carry me if need be. It's putting what God wants us to do ahead of our own. It's taking time to praise God before we ever even ask for anything, but just, God, I thank you for the air that I breathe. God, I thank you for this day I woke up. I'm still here. There's still things to do, right? It's taking a moment to, to praise God and to trust God. And our last one is intelligence. And that kind of struck me funny. Intelligence. How do we love God with our intelligence? Well, it, it's different, right? It's not necessarily a word like, I'm going to love you with all of my intelligence. Like, you're not going to say that, you know, it's weird. So how do we love God with our brains? Well, God has given us the ability to think, to reason, to make decisions, to dream a little bit maybe. Yeah. I believe this means that we should focus on God when we make our rationalizations, when we analyze things, when we reason with people that we would keep God's will and God's love forefront. Do our thoughts bring glory to God or are we solely thinking of ourselves and our decisions that we make? So this leads us into Christ's second command. So loving God is paramount and everything else comes from that, but there's still more to do, right? He says to love others as well as you love yourself. In 1 Corinthians 13, as you all know, it says it best. It says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak with God's word with prayer, excuse me, if I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say and what I believe and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. It's easy to do things for other people, especially when people are watching. It's easy. It makes you feel good. But if we don't love them, when we help them, it means nothing. Alexander the Great had one of the greatest empires this world had ever seen from him. But without love, it means nothing. You can change the face of the planet. Call mountains to jump into the ocean. I've heard it fall into the ocean, but how much more for them to jump into the ocean? Things that our mind can't even comprehend and grasp, but if we don't love while we're doing it, it's just a creaky, rusty gate. It's pointless. But with that love, imagine how many more things we can do. If you have the faith to call a mountain to jump into the ocean and you do have love, how many more mountains are just going to jump on in with it, right? If you help people, just giving them a hand up, not just out of yourself, but out of love. Wow. Imagine how many people that person can, can love on as well, can share that love. Because all love comes from God. All good things come from God. And God is love. So if we don't love, can we really do things of God? So my challenge to you today is to love God, right, because it all starts there. If you have that, there's nothing else that matters. Without that, nothing else matters. But you have to have that. You have to start there. So my challenge is to love God and to love others, not just do things for others, but to love others. Sometimes it hurts. 
Sometimes it's painful. It's hard. It makes us vulnerable. The truly love is opening of ourself and giving, right? And to live out that love. To truly, with everything that we are, with our passion and our prayer and our intelligence, to love God. And with everything that we are, to love others more than we love ourselves. I want to throw this in here too. It's okay to love yourself. You're supposed to. You're supposed to take care of yourself. But you got to remember to love others too. When you hold open that door for someone going into a restaurant, you want them to do that for you, right? So you do it for them. And sometimes you even do it better for them, right? It's loving God. It's loving other people out of that love and then living it out, truly making it part of who we are. And the challenge at NYC, after they spent, you know, three or four days with messages and speakers and worship that just, that got you, it got you deep down. It reached you. It reached me. They closed with go. Don't just stay here. Don't just sit here. Don't just think about it. Don't just, yeah, I'll probably do that next week. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? Don't wait. One of my biggest regrets in my life is when God told me to be a youth pastor, I waited. I thought I had to be an adult. I thought I had to have a pastor's license. I thought I had to have all these other things to, to do what God called me to do. But when God calls you, God calls you. And one of my biggest regrets in life was waiting, was just sitting on it and like, well, it'll happen eventually. And, you know, maybe he'll change his mind before I do it and then I won't have to do it. And, and I waited. And I look back at the people that I could have helped and the people that I could have reached out to and the people that I could have saved them from so much pain. But I didn't because I didn't love others more than myself because I didn't love God in the way that I was supposed to. So my challenge for you today is to go. Go do it. Don't wait. There's no time like the present. We're not promised tomorrow. So go. If there's something between you and God and you just want to talk to him about it, if there's something that's standing in your way of truly being able to love God, you get Pastor Matt to come up if you could for a minute. If there's something in the way, if there's a, a barrier there, even if it's just a speck, just a little something that it'd be all right. Don't worry about it. Even if it's just something that a little speck, those little specks grow. I want you to come up to the altar and just have some time with Jesus, have some time with God to get everything between you clear. Because when you love God with everything that you are, with all that you have, with everything that he's given you, and you can love others. But you got to have that first. But if there's something that you and everything between you and God is good, and there's something that's, that's hindering you from loving others, from being the person that you were called to be to other people, if there's some fear, if there's doubt, I want to challenge you to come to the altar, to give it to God. Moses, who was later called the most humble man to have ever lived, when God called him, he was, he was frantic. Uh, I think you have the wrong person. I can't talk well. I can't do this. You know, I'm 80 years old. There's a death warrant out for me. I, I, I can't do this. All right, God doesn't call the qualified. God doesn't call the people that have it all together. God calls the lost and the broken. And the reason for that is when, when you do what God calls you to do, they can't say it was you. Because if it was just you, you couldn't do it. And it gives God all the glory. So I want you to t take this time and just come to the altar. I don't want to tarry long. But I just want you to know there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity that you can get things clear with God. There's an opportunity that you can truly be who you were called to be today.